Round four of the Sinkfield Cup saw the encounter between Fabiano Caruana and Hikaru Nakamura. This is always a great matchup because these two are big rivals. Of course, they're vying for the number one spot in the USA, but it's pretty deep, this rivalry. Hikaru Nakamura has a tendency to be quite outspoken. Earlier in the year, he said in, in, in an interview of Fabiano, he said, well, Caruana's very good in his opening preparation, but after the opening, he's, quotes, significantly weaker than the other top players, end of quote. That's a pretty harsh judgment, and just bear that in mind while going over this game. First of all, as a little prelude, I just want to remind you of this position that was reached in the encounter between Carlson and Karyakin from around two, and here Magnus played at rook d1 and managed to grind out a very long win. So bear that in mind while looking at this game. Caruana with the white pieces, open with d4. Well, he does do that occasionally. He's mainly an e4 man, but obviously something special in mind today, or yesterday, I should say, against Nakamura. Queen's Gambit? No. Caruana switches into a Catalan. And he plays this variation with knight e5. Now, this is exactly the same as that Carlson Karyakin game, but in that game there was a bishop b4 and a3 that was flicked in. So it's exactly the same position, but with a pawn on a3. This is actually a pretty well known line. You can play c5 here. I've played that, and I think black is all right. But knight c6 is the other main move. And basically, black is giving up pawns in order to facilitate speedy development. It's a well-known position. So white is grabbing an extra pawn. Black's pawns look a bit of a mess, but after c5, he's opening the position with white's king still in the middle. And as white has got rid of that light square bishop, you never know this chap on, B7, on c8 and b7 shortly, uh, could come into the game with big effect. So the main line of this is queen takes and then e5, and black has compensation. But d takes c5, and you will recall that this is exactly the same position as Carlson Karyakin, except the pawn stands on a2, instead of a3. It doesn't make a huge difference, actually. So Nakamura has actually had this position with black previously on a couple of occasions. His opponents have castled Kingside, uh, Svidler, and Wei Yi played rook d1 against him, as did Carlson, as Carlson's move. But here, Fabiano came up with an extraordinary idea. Castles Queenside. Wow! Great stuff! Uh, I couldn't believe it when I saw this on the board. Um, and I assumed that Caruana had thought of this idea having seen Carlson's game. But no, he said after the game that I found this move a few months ago. Very interesting. So he finally had the opportunity to use it. One of the ideas of playing this is that in some circumstances, he will be able to advance pawns on the king side without fear of exposing his king, because of course the king is on the other side of the board. But I mean, that's a very theoretical idea, but still, it can be possible. King also protects this pawn on b2, useful for the moment. And well, the rook comes to the d file anyway, which is useful. Knight g4 from Nakamura seems to me this is a very logical move because black is able to grab this very important bishop straight away. If the bishop comes to d4, we can just play e5 and white has to keep a hold of f2. So basically here, white has to give up this bishop. But Karamwana playing still very quickly. Nakamura having to invest a lot of time to somehow come to grips with this very unusual position. 
he took the bishop. Well, this looks very logical. I think this is a, a very sound way for black to play. And rook b8, of course, on the semi-open file, activating. It's a very unusual position. With, first of all, the king positions, um, but also the pawn structure, because, well, these aren't very beautiful, but neither are these. What's white got going for him here? Well, he has very well coordinated pieces, beautiful pieces, controls the D file. And that makes it difficult for black to develop the queen's bishop. So we would like to play bishop B7, but obviously this is very uncomfortable. I mean, Caruana said after the game that he thought that black's position is actually basically fine but if you're not familiar with it, then it's very easy to go wrong. And here, for example, he thought that queen c5 is a decent move, uh, activating the queen straight away. Um, and it, it's complicated, but for example, here, hitting the back rank, and white is going to get the pawn back. even material um, but that's still a very double-edged position because in some circumstances you know if there's a queen exchange then this uh, queenside pawn majority could be potent with a rook you know entering on, on the d file as well so very double-edged but you know we're not in an end game yet of course Nakamura played a5 and Caruana just brought his king to safety in the corner. It's actually very difficult for, for both sides to make significant progress here. Again, bishop b7 could be answered by rook d7. Queen c5 will be met by rook d8. That's uncomfortable. So after a 20 minute think, Nakamura just put the rook back on b8. It's incredible. Queen e4 activates the queen again. And then bishop a8. So at least Nakamura has managed to bring the bishop into play, although it's shooting into the air, but okay, it's reasonable on the long diagonal. And he's managed to connect his rooks. e4, rook c8. And here, Caruana played queen f2, which looks like a slightly strange move to me. You know, the queen is in a nice position in the middle of the board. I was anticipating playing for an endgame with queen d6. After the game, Caruana said that he was wanting to perhaps advance his kingside pawns, maybe like this. But he was worried that if the attack didn't come through, then that could merely weaken those pawns. In any case, queen f2 played. And the queen came back again. Very difficult position for both sides to really achieve something. But here I really don't like Nakamura's next move. I think he played bishop b8, offering exchange of queens. I think black should keep the queens on here, queen b7, and just offer a pawn. I mean, actually, both either pawn can be taken, but in both cases, Black gets pretty good compensation. This reminds me of Sicilian positions where these files open and this is not easy for, for White to kind of alleviate this pressure actually. Or Queen A5, <clears throat> which should be E4. And again, I think you know Black has, has decent pressure. But Bishop B8. I don't like at all because this endgame, while objectively might still be okay for black, I think black has enough here to, to compensate for white's activity. I think it's a much easier position for white to play than black. You can see this is a beautiful rook on a7 on the seventh rank, looking at the pawn on a5 as well. And that bishop really isn't doing very much. Now it's time to bring the king back.
at least black has a nice active rook on e5, but with the knight securely anchored on c3, protecting the pawn, this minor piece is superior to the bishop on e8, which really isn't doing that much. And the king activates. So, but I mean, Nakamura has counterplay here. And now the king comes across and is looking to sit on this very nice square on e3. Rook b7 was played in order to prevent rook b8 attacking the pawn on b2. So that rook doing a really good job on b7. It's active, but also defending that, that one weakness in the position. Here, rook c5 looks correct in order to offer an exchange of rooks. That is a strong piece, so we should exchange it off. I think white is still for choice in this position. For example, after this and rook d1 activating this the second rook and looking to hassle that bishop. That bishop is the big problem in this position, as we're going to see. It doesn't have a pawn to anchor it, to give it proper support. So black always has to look after it with the rook. So white's still better there, in my opinion. But here, Nakamura played f5. And again, I think that is a huge error of judgment. Um, Anand had finished his game by this point and was, was uh, commenting on this game. And he said this just seemed horrible. He thought this was a horrible move. Basically because it opens up Black's king. And I think Nakamura had completely underestimated the danger here. After pawn takes pawn, rook h1, followed by bringing the rook over and Black's king is in massive trouble here. Rook h6, mate threatened. And I think here uh, Nakamura compounded the error by taking on e4. We'll look at that in a second. King g King g5 has to be played. And I, I don't like black's position. I think the king is in trouble here. Um, but it's still, you know, this is still hard work. You, white still has to win this position. I think white's forces coordinate very well. But pawn takes pawn here. This is another mistake. King e3 is kind of an irresistible move. Um, blockading that pawn and making sure that this bishop really doesn't have any freedom at all. It's also possible to take on h6, but king e3 is the kind of positional move which is very hard to resist. That king is uh, really secure on, on e3. But contrast that with black's king. Huge trouble here. And now, well, let's see if king g8, this might actually be better than the game continuation, but still highly unpleasant. Let's just have a little look at what can happen here. Okay, the, the, these moves are not forced, but it gives you an idea of the problems that black has. So material is even, but all these pawns are weak. And the problem is that, that again, it's this bishop. It doesn't have a pawn to support it. So black always has to protect it with a rook. And these the rook, white's rook, can flash across the board, hassling the pawns, hassling the king. And this knight completely secure, and the king just roaming around on the dark squares. Very difficult position for black to defend. So coming back to the game, the king came up the board, but this is very unpleasant. A rook wants to check here. Rook d6 still threatened. And now the rook switches back to the h file, really nasty. And here Nakamura made another blunder. He could have taken here, it's still pretty dire, 
And after rook h5, you can take on a5, but rook h5 is probably even stronger with just a huge attack against black's king, actually. In the game h5 played, I mean, it looks very reasonable, but this is a great move from Caruana, obviously overlooked by Nakamura. If pawn takes pawn, we give a check. And that's mate in a couple of moves. Or rook takes, and once again, black's king is in dire straits in this position. And that pawn falling in combination with the attack on the king, the loose bishop, and all these weak pawns, it's too much. In the game, after g4, bishop b8 played. Pawn exchanged on h5. Knight e4. Now the knight joins in the attack just to add insult to injury. Knight e6 is a fork. Only one way out to give a check. Now, black can actually save material by playing rook c5, but e4 is a beautiful move. Now, that is a picture of solid centralization, threatening knight f5 check, and the winner of the bishop. And if the bishop goes back, then again, that hapless bishop without proper protection and black is utterly lost here. If the rook comes across to protect it, then we can simply take and take on c5. So in this position, after the check and king d4, Nakamura actually resigned the game. I think a pretty convincing victory by Fabiano. I think he played excellently. He, he used his chances very well, exploited his chances very well indeed. But I have to say a disappointing game from Hikaru Nakamura, who at a couple of critical moments, I think made poor errors of judgment. Um, yeah, I think he heaps pressure on himself actually with some of his... Uh, public statements. <laughs> Sometimes it's okay to think these things, but to to say these things in public, in, in open, um, in the open, um, about your potential opponents, yeah, it puts more pressure on you. Um, we know Hikaru is a brilliant speed player. He won the Blitz and Rapid tournament before the Classical started, but he seems to be having problems in Classical chess at the moment. After four rounds, there are no less than five players in the lead. On two and a half points, this is such a tight tournament. Aronian, Carlson, Mamadjarov, Grishuk and Caruana have two and a half. MVL and Anand on two. Wesley Saw on one and a half. Nakamura and Karyakin on one. If you want to check out my previous videos, um, then do click on the links in the info tab and you'll find um, also playlists of... Caruana, Nakamura on the channel. Do check out those links as well. And uh, if you haven't subscribed, please do subscribe and do consider supporting the channel to keep the lights on on patreon.com powerplaychess and join the inner circle. Thanks for watching.